What we're going to do, it's kind of got a little two-part, a little short part with the Word. I want to talk a little bit about apostolic prayer just for a little bit, a little sample. And then we're going to go to the main part of the message, which is going to be me kind of talking about where we're at now uh, with revival fires starting to break out and where we kind of fit in that and kind of the history of my personal history and also how that ties in to the history of this church. So uh, let's go ahead first. I want to open up to the book of Ephesians. You know, sometimes people say, well, I don't know what to pray or, or how to pray. Well, we have a couple of examples of things you can pray for people. And these are things really to pray for yourself. Pray for your family and pray for your church family. But in, there's two different apostolic prayers just in the book of Ephesians, and so I want to look at those. And it's in chapter 1, and starting with verse 15. So if the Apostle Paul thought this was pretty important to pray for the church at Ephesus, then I think we ought to realize it's probably important for us to begin to, to pray over ourselves and over our families and our church body. And so Paul says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, Okay, what? He may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation so that you may know him better. Now, how many of us need that? Spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know him better, that we might experience him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. And then I think I'll go ahead and skip to chapter 3. There's another one, verse 14 through 19. So chapter, chapter 3, verse 14 through 19. And it says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derive its names. I pray that his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and how high and deep is the love of Christ. And not only to know what in your mind, but to know it in your heart. So, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. So again, those are a couple prayers that are listed. Uh, And it gives us an insight of how to pray for ourselves, how to pray for our families, how to pray for our church family that we may have a deeper walk with the Lord, a deeper understanding. And it's not just a mental knowledge. It has to be a place where it becomes where it's real to you, heart understanding and heart knowledge. And I do want to read one more now that I've closed it up. But Ephesians 4, it's not a prayer, but this is, again, something we've talked about before. The fivefold ministry. Okay, in verses uh, 11... Through 13, where am I at? 
It says, It was he, talking about Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So those gifts were given to prepare God's people for works of the service. Now, if you remember, I I played a a video, uh, one of our Bibles and Brunch, I think it was from Bethel, but it it gave you insight into how all these different gifts, everybody looks through their own lens. So, for the evangelist, he's wondering, Bill Jesse here, what are we even sitting in here for? When there's cars going down that road on the way to hell, you guys don't care. You're just sitting in here. You know, and then we have the, the prophet who, you know, everything means something. That, that digital clock or that microwave clock is not just, that's a portal into heaven. And so everything, everything means something. And I kind of have had some experience with that too. But... Uh, and like I say, so in their lives, there's a lot going on. And actually, this last week, I've been kind of caught up in a real prophetic, prophetic uh, swirl. Um, and then we have the teacher. Now, the teacher wants, obviously, to teach. And his concept is, if you knew the Word of God, you wouldn't have the problems you've got. That's your problem. You don't know the Word of God. And the pastor... He wants to gather everybody around, all together, have a fellowship meal, and keep everybody safe, and we're all hugging, and, and that's what the pastor, that's his viewpoint. An apostle, of course, you know, it's power. You know, it's like an old 10 steps program, one step, Shaba, you know, in the name of Jesus, you're done, you know. So you have all those different gifts with different lenses, and somehow they all have to come together, work together, and appreciate and realize the other gifts that are in the body. And that we all don't see things, you know, the same way. So anyway, just a little aside. Now, now I'm seeing smoke. So what's that all about? This, I need to pray first because I need to try to figure to get things in order. Because um, I'm going to talk some, actually some about myself which I usually don't do, and also talk about history and, again, where we are today. So, Lord, I just ask that, Lord, you would just grant your anointing. I ask that you would grant just, uh, Lord, to bring to remembrance those things you want to have shared. Put things in order that there'd be understanding amongst this people of where we are standing today on February 19th, twenty. 23. So, you know the saying, when you see smoke, there's fire, right? So, this past week, I'll probably, most of you have probably heard what's going on at Asbury College or University in Kentucky where the revival broke out. And it, uh, they normally have three chapel services a week, and it was just a normal chapel service, except that the presence of God was there, and people's lives were being changed. People, all these college students were repenting. They were, they were coming before the Lord. They were feeling the love of God, and they didn't want to leave, and they didn't leave, and so this has been going on since February 8th. And now you can't really get in there because the line is a quarter mile long and you couldn't get in anyway when you get there because they're limited in the number of seats they have. But since that time, it, it has spread to other universities, probably at least a dozen now, where this is, is spreading. And so it's like these fires are starting to burn, starting to burn. Starting. And so that, 
it really caught my attention this week. And then on top of that, I was, this, this is one of those kind of prophetic things, but I saw three, three eagles three different times. Uh, just one time going to church, one, you know, different roads, different times during the same week. And it was like, first time I thought, well, that's not, I like seeing eagles. And, and then the second time, I kind of, huh. And then the third time, I felt like the Lord was speaking through that. That it's kind of a, a release of a higher level of prophetic and just what the Lord is wanting to do and is starting to do in the earth. So, again, you're going to have to try to follow this because it's going to be hard. I'm going to kind of be jumping back and forth. Um, where is that? So, again, February 8th, 2023, that happened, right? Starts that, that revival, which is beginning to spread and beginning to go. Okay, obviously, in case any of you haven't been alive, Chiefs won the Super Bowl this year. You know, okay. So, in 1970, the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, and revival broke out at Asbury University. And then it spread across the nation, and it was the beginning of the Jesus movement that touched thousands and thousands and thousands of life. Uh, people, especially mainly hippies, were coming into the kingdom of God, and lives were being changed forever. And a lot of those hippies are leaders in the church today. In fact, one of the leaders was, was a pastor here, Fred Kropp. And he was one of those hippies that got radically saved. Uh, and so there's a prophecy that came that, that uh, when the Chiefs won the Super Bowl again, there would be another outpouring of the Spirit. Well, the Chiefs also won in 2020. So there was an expectation that that was going to be it, that it was, this was the breaking in, this was the start of revival. And instead, we got COVID, shut down the churches. In that year, in the following years, there were a lot of exposures within the church of a lot of leaders that fell. They were exposed and, and fell. And so it was almost like the Lord was, the enemy was attacking, but also at the same time, the Lord was purifying his church. So, again, I'm going to be jumping around. When we first started coming to this church, uh, it was like in November of 14. And I'm going to have to go give you a time or a reversal of where we kind of came from up to that time. So I had been, you know, back from 1995 till 2003, I was a pastoring a, a church out in the country, this little church, Baptist church. And we experienced some move of the Spirit. Uh, we also had a coffee house in Drexel. It was a Christian coffee house. We call it the 1111 Coffee House because at that time, we were getting waked up every night and every day, and every time I looked at the clock, it would be 1111. And so it was, it was just one of those prophetic things that happens. Um, after that ended and the time came where uh, I resigned and uh, we've always kind of had home groups and had Bible studies but then uh, I felt we were praying and felt like well I was probably supposed to go up to, to IHOP to be part of that. I'd met with Mike and he thought well you know you could teach at IHOP, you could teach at IHOP you and, and we even went up there and started looking for houses. But when we did, it just felt like, no, we weren't supposed to do that. So we didn't. And so it's kind of like wondering, okay, well, what's next? And uh, during that time where I was up there, I did a couple of different uh, things with IHOP. But then I met uh, through a, a chaplaincy course that we took up there. Uh, Sean Malone, who was actually the, uh, he was just now starting Crisis Response International. So I got kind of involved in that and did those early years, did a 
huge amount of traveling, uh, going to East Coast, West Coast, and this was all road trips, and meeting with churches all through and houses of prayer across California down the East Coast, Florida, back and forth, went down to New Orleans, all within one year. I mean, I couldn't believe how many miles did that time. And we were um, giving the vision, and we were also uh, doing training. We were getting trained, and then we were training other groups, other churches, houses of prayer who were interested in, in preparation and, and, in, uh, and in responding to natural disasters. And then I responded to several different hurricanes where we'd go and, and you know, serve the people. We'd have food. We'd have a big van and, and uh, trailers that we would cook and feed people, stuff like that. And then, uh, so we did that. Some hurricanes went to Haiti after the earthquake. Ministered there quite a bit. And then, as that was going on, uh, all of a sudden... They moved, because their headquarters at that time was in Grandview. Well, then they moved to the East Coast. Then they moved to the West Coast. Then they moved to Hawaii, and now they're in Virginia. So, you know, I, I couldn't follow all that and, and stay that involved. So, at that time, uh, because we, one thing Glenn and I found out, that a lot of people who want to respond to those things are not prepared themselves. So we started doing some preparedness trainings, and we did that down in Texas and Illinois and Wisconsin, different places where we'd be invited to speak about preparation for people to be prepared in their own lives for things that happen. And so we did that. Uh, but one thing we kind of found, sometimes people were more interested in a list and what to do than they were the spiritual preparation. And so as that was kind of ending... Uh, we just felt kind of, you know, it's time to kind of slow down from that, quit traveling. And so it was at that point that I st- we started coming here, okay? So I had been down, we had been down in, in Houston, Texas. We had a grandson that had open-heart surgery. So we were down for the surgery and staying in, in a hotel right across the street. And... During that time, our credit card got hacked, and I was down, we were down in the lobby talking to the, to the hotel manager and trying to figure out what we're going to do because our, our credit card was hacked, and, and all of a sudden, I just pa- I passed out, fell down. There was a, a popcorn machine there. I hit my head in the popcorn machine, so I wake up, you know, in a little pool of blood, and, you know, ended up going to urgent care and getting sewed up. And about the next day or two, we were coming back. And so, you know, here I have stitches, and I got black and blue eyes. And and so I was asking the Lord, you know, Glenn had to drive away because I supposedly had a concussion, couldn't drive. So my my question was, Lord, am I done? Literally. You know, is my time over? Is is this, you know, as far as ministry-wise or anything else? And... um, so that's how it was when I came in that Sunday morning, because we came back Saturday. So I came in here, we're sitting there in the back, and Caesar called us out, told us to stand up, and he began to prophesy. And it... <clears throat> prophesied a lot of things that were just right on, just right down the line about our past, things that we've done and, and what was in there. And, um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of that detail, but the most important part of it was at the end. Because see, ever since 1983, from that 21-day fast, the Lord had put within me revival. Mark me for Revival. So he comes to the end of this word and says, you are called to revival. So at that time I knew the Lord wasn't through and it awakened my spirit and, just, and then 
over the course of time, obviously things have, have changed from then. Um, so, but it was interesting that 1983, doing that fast, we were, um, we had just started going there a couple months before that. In fact, after Mike Bickle had come back from St. Louis and was starting the church, and um, in December, we started going, you know, late January, early February, uh, I had been away from the Lord. Well, go back farther. Um, Glenn and I have this argument because when I was about 12 in Bible school, I um, gave my heart to the Lord. And, but then as I went through high school and then through college, obviously I got way uh, backslidden big time. Away from the Lord. Um, I was a big-time partier, and so it wasn't until I was actually 29 that I kind of had an encounter and changed that, and once that happened, I, I just went, you know, it was just like from going this direction, going that direction, 100 mile an hour, and incredible growth, so that was 1980. So during those next couple of years, then we got, we became acquainted. We were going to Redbridge Baptist Church at that time. And as we began to study, we began to see that obviously Southern Baptists are usually cessationists, don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. And we became aware that there's nothing in the Bible we see that, that says that, you know, that we became aware that, no, this is still for today. So the problem was, we, I didn't have a clue where to go. You know, I didn't, I heard some things about Pentecostal, but I thought, they're pretty weird people. Holy rollers, you know, and all that. <laughs> so uh, I don't know about that. So, yeah, so at that time, I, yeah, I used to drive around, and, and I, was, uh, I was in marketing in the Postal Service, so I, I covered a lot of the over park area, I'd call on large businesses, and, and I was listening to the, always, always listening to the Christian radio. And they happened to be interviewing Mike Bickle uh, on this interview show. And I heard, I thought, well, that could be, maybe that's something that we're looking for. So as it turned out, we, we ended up going on a Tuesday night. They had a Tuesday and a Sunday service. And we knew that first service, that, that this was where we were supposed to be. So that was in, in uh, early 83. And then the fast took place. Uh, that year, that spring, ended March 7th, or May 7th, and again, I was marked for revival during that time. Okay, that's been 40 years. 40 years since the promises, and that's not to say, and so, as I was picturing that this week, it was like 40 years in the wilderness. Like, and that doesn't mean things weren't happening. A lot of the good things happened. But the fullness of what we are praying for at that time for a mighty revival and third great awakening didn't happen or hadn't happened. And obviously over that number of years, you get discouraged and you wonder if it's ever going to happen. But uh, I was not aware, of course, at that time until... Probably till I talked to Fred Crop a lot that how involved he was, and Jerry said he was involved also during this time. So there was a connection between what was happening up there and what was happening here, which I was not aware of. In fact, Fred Crop told me he said he went up to the planning meeting before the the twenty one day fast was going to start. And he took someone with him. I don't know if it was associate pastor or, or who. And as he was driving back, he said to the guy, he said, you know, that, my, that meeting was not organized at all. That, you know, that, you know. And he said, as he drove back, he instantly got sick, very, very sick. And he knew it wasn't just you know, a normal sickness coming on. So he said when he got home, he, was, he started praying, you know, and the Lord revealed and told him 
you're fighting against what I wanted to do. And he called Mike and apologized, said, you know, I've got to tell you, you know, I, I was complaining, I was, you know, how the meeting went, and uh, confessed that. And just as fast as he was sick, that fast he was healed. And then he told me about the impact that it had on his life during that same time. So there's a connection between this church and what was happening up there and what is now, now IHOP. So in 1970, again, that, that uh, revival broke out in Asbury College. And again, it spread to other colleges. It spread across the nation. California, a lot of stuff was going on. A guy named Lonnie Frisbee, I don't know if you know him, he was a hippie, drug addict, homosexual, who got radically saved. And I saw videos of him. He'd just stand up on a, at the beach on a bench and said, God loves you. And people would just flock. Yes, come running. And the shows them baptizing in the ocean, hundreds of people being baptized. And so it was just a unique time where the Spirit of God was moving in a powerful way. So, trying to catch up on where I'm at. And by the way, if you want to know something, kind of the history of that early time, in fact, I just, this is another thing that happened this week. I was listening to uh, Dr. Sam Storm has done a, a whole series, the 16th series on it's called the Kansas City Prophets. And it uh, goes through that old uh, history that, that I was there, we were there, to experience all those things. And just brought back again that excitement and that, that to see how God is moving powerfully in those days and how the prophetic was such important. So that's kind of the, the history that... We prophesied again, Bob Jones prophesied that once the Chiefs win again, well, they won in 2020, that wasn't it. But this time, it looks like this is it. This may be what we have been waiting for for 40 years, seeing the fulfillment of another mighty move of God. And like in Asbury, there's no big name speaker, no worship, big worship team or anything like that. It's just the people that are there. They're coming into the presence of the Lord and their lives are being radically changed. Acts 3.19 or Acts 3 verse 19-20 I'll just paraphrase it but it says, repent that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So those times when the presence of the Lord comes, it's not a a man-made thing. You know, when I was growing up, I was a Baptist, and uh, we had a revival every year. It was a scheduled thing, which meant you had a a, a evangelist come in or a different speaker, but we called it a revival. Well, you don't schedule a revival, you know. (laughs) God's the one who initiated it, and, and God's the one who does it. So in thinking of some of that, and I think what's about to happen with us, you know, first is a a revival of God's people, you know, within the church, and then expands to evangelism, or what we might call a great awakening, where there are multitudes that come in. But you have to realize these are people with no background or understanding of Christianity. So some of you might get offended with their actions and with their language. But you got to realize they don't know any different. They don't have any background. They don't have any understanding. And so that causes us, for one thing, one of those fruits of the Spirit, patience. And sometimes I find myself, I don't have a lot of patience, but we're going to need to have patience patience with people because they're going to be very rough around the edges and it also requires great wisdom to know where to draw the line okay 
Because, as I told you guys before, revival is messy. It's messy. It's, it's glorious, but it's also messy. But it's well worth the mess. Now, we don't want to make a stake, mistake that many churches made during the, the Jesus movement. Because what happened was, a lot of the churches would not accept those hippies who were coming in, long-haired, smelled sometimes, barefoot, rock and rollers, and they were kind of like shunned them. And a lot of those churches dried up. But the churches that received them grew and flourished and expanded all over the place. It wasn't always smooth. Like I say, it, it, it's messy sometimes, but it's worth the mess. And it also means revival is going to require much more of us. Think about it. In a way, it's a lot more comfortable right now we know everybody, we're all comfortable, we all know each other's life, it's just, you know, it's good. But it has to change. And that means, you know, kind of, here's an equation, revival equals work. It's going to be a lot of work. And it's going to mean we probably just won't be having a, a Sunday service. Probably be expanded more services. And that requires more of all of us. And so our priorities have to change because you still have to live life. You know, eventually, what's happening in Asbury, they're, they're still going to have classes. They've got to have tests. If you have jobs, you still got to have a job. you still got to work. But those discretionary times need to change. And we're, we're giving much more of that to the Lord's work. And how do you evaluate a revival? By its fruit. And that may take a few years to actually, actually evaluate it because you want lasting fruit. Lives that are really changed, that are not the same they were before. And it's not just an emotional high because sometimes that can happen. You get carried away and, and get emotional but if there's not lasting fruit, if people's lives aren't changed, then you, then you have to question. Some of the highlights are, are, that will have to be focused on is worship, prayer, and the Word. And we can't neglect any of those. But a more of an intense time of all of those. Again, I say we're going to need great wisdom because you don't want to squelch the Spirit, but yet at the same time you have to know where that line is, where you draw the line. Now, Wednesday nights we have started. Jesse has agreed to play worship on Wednesday nights between 6.30 and 8.30. So I would encourage you all to take advantage of that time just to come into the presence of the Lord. We're going to do that every Wednesday. So put that on your schedule. You can come and you can go as you want. But it's available. And so my question is for you guys, what's your response? I think the Lord is offering us an opportunity an invitation to enter into a time of revival and praying for a third great awakening. But it's going to cost. You have to count the cost because there is a cost to it. And we have to, you have to have your yes inside of you. So what I want to do, I'm going to have Jesse, if you come, go ahead and come up. We're going to do some more, some worship.
And we're going to, I would encourage anyone to come forward just to be in the presence of the Lord. For each of you to be asking yourselves that question, am I willing to count the cost to help usher in a revival? It's not something you need to travel somewhere or go to Ashbury or anywhere else. Right here. You know, we have an opportunity right here. If we're willing for it. If we're, again, changing our priorities, our heart standards, and being ready to press in to the Lord and coming with hungry hearts that will not give up, that will continue to press in to the Lord's presence. Because when the Lord walks in, everything changes. His presence changes everything.